All right, this is going to be a video that was prompted by uh, YouTube user GS Debunked from the UK. Uh, he'd been, you know, he watches a lot of Peter Schiff and stuff about the economy. And uh, he was seeing a lot of videos by a guy named Bill Still. And he wanted to know what I thought about Bill Still. And I said, well, I actually made a video about that when I first started. Uh, doing YouTube videos uh, a year and a half ago, and I forwarded it to him. And I basically explained it, but you know, I was looking at it. I only have about 20 views on that video. I don't usually, when you start, I guess, you usually don't have that many hits. And so, not many people have seen it. And I think the whole Bill Still is basically, he's an anti Fed critic, and he's as strong an anti Fed critic as really you can be, uh, but he's also a greenbacker. And if we look at the um, opposition to the Fed, the real strong opposition to the Fed, not the Barney Frank kind of, I wish that there's a slightly more oversight type of opposition, but the real, real principled institutional um, objections to the Fed, there's really kind of two types. There's, broadly speaking, gold standard people of one type or another. Either they want the government to issue gold coins or they want there to be a market which they assume will be one based on silver and gold, or there are greenbackers who are people who think that the money, the, the, the government should simply print money out of thin air rather than borrowing money out of thin air and then printing that. Um, and Bill Still is one of the main proponents of the latter type. And I've been fam somewhat familiar, not with him personally and everything about him, but with his work for a long time. He produced... Well, really, I still consider it to be an excellent documentary about the Federal Reserve called The Money Masters. I think I saw this documentary, oh, 2003, 2004. I think it was made in the 90s, although I can't be sure about that. Or I'm not sure about that. I'm sure I could figure it out if I really cared. And uh, it's basically, a th it's about three hours long. You can see it on YouTube or Google Video. It's pretty easy to find. I liked it enough that I would frequently make CDR copies of the, of it and hand them out to people. Say, hey, watch, this is good, this is good. I wonder how many of those ever actually got watched, I'm not sure. Um, but it, it's got a, real, a lot of really good history in there, and you're going to hear all the names of, you know, um, Thomas Biddle and uh, Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson and obviously... Uh, not Peter Schiff, Jacob Schiff, and uh, Nelson Aldridge, and uh, Kuhn Loeb and Company, and Rockefeller, and J.P. Morgan, and uh, all, a whole litany of people, Edward Mandel House, Bernard Baruch, all these people that uh, everyone should be really familiar with, and yet very few people are. Most of them, I mean, everyone's heard of Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, but... Um, but this is a good example, I think, of a refutation of the saying that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Uh, you know, I hate the Fed, Austro-Libertarians hate the Fed, and Greenbackers hate the Fed. But it's kind of like with the anarcho-syndicalists. Yeah, we hate the state, they claim to hate the state, but what they advocate in in for a replacement is at least as bad or maybe even worse. In the case of the anarcho-syndicalists, it's actually worse. In the case of the Greenbackers, I don't know if it's worse, it's just not any better. Um, at least that would be my take on it. So this is a case where, even though we agree on getting rid of the Fed, we disagree on what to do uh, instead, and so, you know, there's a lot of animosity here. Um, Bill Still is a conspiracy theorist, which I don't hold against him because I'm more or less a conspiracy theorist, and I don't, I'm not one of those people who says it's automatically invalid, but I think it's gotten a little bit too far with him. Basically, uh, Still thinks that um, gold sta a gold standard would be good for um, the elites, however you want to define that, and that... Uh, you know, the, the the people out there who are advocating for a gold standard like Ron Paul and the Austrians, who he never cites the Austrians by name, uh, they're either shills for the elite or they're dupes of the elite. And that really the elite wants a gold standard. And uh, 
I think the rationale for this is uh, by his estimate, a large percentage of the world's gold reserves are held by the elite, so defined. In fact, maybe even specifically a couple families. I have heard this for years and years uh, that somebody, usually the Rothschilds, but sometimes the Rockefellers, and I've even heard other families, you know, I've heard theories that the Rothschilds aren't really the richest, and there's other families that are above them and and whatnot. What is it, the 16 families? I'm not all up on that stuff anymore. And that they just control, you know, 80, 90% of the gold reserves. Um, gosh, I don't know if that's really true or not. I think there's usually considered to be pretty good estimates of how much gold there is in the world. Obviously, there's going to be some that isn't accounted for. But most of it's held by central banks. And I guess if you... Uh, of the opinion, and I guess it's not a totally basis one, that the central banks are all owned by, you know, the Morgan interests or the the Rothschilds, and I guess it's possible. But the obvious question is, if, if the gold standard, and again, gold standard has several meanings in, in, in common parlance. Uh, historically, the way government has treated gold standards has varied quite a bit. You have bimetallic standards, you have uh, in the United States, technically, it was on the gold standard until 1971, but the, the gold standard that was being practiced in 1971 was uh, unrecognizably different from the standard that was being used in the 1920s uh, or the 1930s. Uh, you know, it changed a lot from Bretton Woods. Basically, uh, I'm not one of those people who thinks if, as long as they put on the moniker gold standard that everything's going to be fine because... Uh, if there isn't a hundred percent redemption, if it's not even allowed to circulate, then really it's, it, it doesn't put a constraint on government. Government can inflate a pyramid of, of bills on top of a quantity of gold and just say, well, it's backed by gold. And if they don't have to redeem, then they can inflate really as much as they want. Um, and in that instance, calling something a gold standard is really just um, trying to lend credence to a fiat currency and say, you know, give it a name that's not fiat, but it's a fa it essentially is a fiat currency at that point. Um, if the redemption is only for other central banks or other governments, which is the system the United States had for a long time, kind that eventually failed because eventually certain governments, especially France, stopped going along with it. There's a whole wink, wink, nod, nod. Uh, yes, it's redeemable in gold. Just please don't actually come and redeem it, which is... <laughs> Which is a, an obvious giveaway that it's not redeemable in gold. And um, eventually Charles de Gaulle said, well, I'm going to redeem these notes. And uh, the Treasury couldn't, couldn't meet the demands. And so Nixon, quote, quote closed the gold window. Uh, that type of gold standard I'm not really interested in. There might be nominally not as bad as what we currently have, but it's certainly nothing to advocate. Um in terms of government issuance of currency, if they actually had a 100% reserve, uh, on-demand, uh, uniform, quality controlled uh, issuance of gold, gold coins and silver coins provided that they had a free exchange ratio and they weren't setting the, the amount, which was the, always one of the problems with the U.S. gold standard is they defined the dollar as so many, so many grains of gold and or so many grains of silver. And the thing is, the market values of the two uh, didn't always meet that. They, I mean, when they originally said it, it was close to that, but it invariably would change. And uh, this is one of the effects when Grisham's Law actually... Grisham's Law is the idea that bad money drives out good. And it's not actually true. It's only true if there's some kind of government mandate that equivocates the two when they're not equivalent. So... If, if the government says that gold and silver are to be valued, 15 ounces of gold is equivalent to one ounce of silver. I'm sorry, 15 ounces of silver is equivalent to one ounce of gold, which I think is roughly what the ratio was, something in there. And suddenly the, the number of silver mines doubles, and there's suddenly on the market really 30 times more silver than gold instead of 15. Uh, it makes sense to, to take your... You know, the market value would say 30 ounces of, of uh, or 15 ounces of silver would only get you half an ounce of gold. But since there's really twice that much, you can go and exchange and get 
you know, double the gold basically because it's been set. And so all what happens is all the gold disappears from that country. It goes into hiding and gets exported. That would be stupid, but as long as the government didn't do that, that kind of gold standard would be better than what we currently have. It wouldn't be ideal because then, you know, the quality of government money is not that great and it's somewhat arbitrary what they'd be picking to circulate. And I, th I think it should just be left up to the market. And then if there are actually some kind of intrinsic problems with gold or silver, uh, say there's too much volatility, uh, perhaps, I, d I don't think that there is, but let's just say that there was a lot of volatility and it just didn't make sense for a medium of exchange and it was fluctuating a lot. If you have a market, then, you know, people can shift to something else. If it's government, it's much harder to do that. But the idea that it's bad because the elites would benefit. I, my first question is, if it's so good for the elites, why don't they have it now? You know, why did they work so long to get rid of the gold standard? Now, this is within whether you or I believe in conspiracies. Bill still does. I mean, I believe in them in this context that... Um, you know, if, if the Rothschilds and the Morgans and the Rockefellers uh, would would be empowered by or enriched by a gold standard, why did they wean society off of it? And why are they apparently not reinstituting it? It was abolished in most major European countries other than Switzerland um, at some point in the 20s or before. They all went off it during World War I, and they all never really got back to it. Some of them tried. Great Britain tried with our help. Uh, we got off of it really in the 1933, but totally by 1971, and it's kind of a question of what, what the hell have they been waiting for. If they're that powerful, they can just reinstitute it. And to me, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, the theoretical argument here is if they, if they really did own all of it, then wouldn't they be able to control it? Uh, the answer to that is not on a free market. That's not really the case. Let's just say that I was the person who controlled 80% of the gold reserves. Let's just say that secretly I'm actually the sole heir of whatever families are the secret controllers of the world, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers. I, I'm their prodigal son. And... Uh, you know, maybe I didn't even know this, and then one day when I turned 18, they showed up and they said, "Hey, you're our son, and we, you know, Fort Knox and the Federal Reserve and all that gold—that's all uh, fiction. That all—that's in a secret vault, and you have the key to it. You know, there's uh, I don't know, half a billion ounces or whatever that, that that's, that's yours, and it's 80 percent or 90 percent of the world supply." Uh, if people started using gold as a medium of exchange, I would become very, very wealthy because of that. Um, you know, they're not using gold as a medium of exchange right now, so its purchasing power relative to other goods is not as high as it would be because people are using it as a hedge against inflation. It has many industrial uses, but people aren't using it to go to the store and buy groceries or to buy cars or to buy houses in general. Uh, and if suddenly there is a demand to use it for that, then its purchasing power relative to those other goods would just skyrocket. And um, it, if it really became the new money, then, you know, we talk about prices of gold and thousands of dollars. It's kind of hard because you're pricing it in terms of the medium of exchange. If it becomes the medium of exchange, then it's not it's a, a little bit of a discombobulation there. But I think you would be talking about like, 10 to 100 times easily more purchasing power. So if, uh, if an ounce of gold could feed a family of four for a month right now, it could probably feed one for more than a year if everybody wanted it for cash. And if I was this elite person with all this gold, I would become very wealthy. But the thing is, if we had some kind of free market, uh, I would end up just spending that gold to consume it, I would, in order, because I can't literally eat the gold, I would be exchanging it for other things. And every time I exchanged it, that quantity of gold that I exchange would be out of my control. That's one of the great things about it is then whoever I paid, they would have it and they'd have no obligation to give it back to me or become enslaved to me. Um, the only way that that could ever happen is if the, the government was somehow uh, mandating that, you know, like saying, okay, uh, lengthy and author has, you know, a monopoly on gold and uh, everyone has to give it back to him whenever he demands it or something like that. It would, and, and 
I would eventually expend my entire gold hoard unless I was able to actually be productive and have people pay me. If I was actually producing things. Of course, if I'm actually producing things, then I'm not a parasite on society no matter what my holdings are. Uh, and so the choices here would be either I'd have to become productive or eventually uh, whatever amount of wealth I had accrued would dissipate. It would erode away. Um, now what still advocates, and this this is the other thing that kind of perplexes me, is he just wants a straight-up fiat dollar, which uh, there's a heavy emphasis in these conspiracy theories about the fact that the U.S. dollar is based on debt. Um, and like it's bad to borrow money because it ends up costing more or whatever, but it's kind of redundant when it's money out of thin air and they're just going to print it up anyway. But uh, the actual effect on you and me and the users of the currency is is only that it loses value. The fact that it's uh, based on debt and so there's an ever-increasing amount of debt and so they have to print more and more, all that means is there's more and more inflation. That's the only uh, influence... The only effect that that policy has on you or me or anybody else who's just using the currency, the the Federal Reserve does not go around to people saying, "Listen, you know, uh, federal government owes this much more money, and so uh, we're taking it from you." The federal government will do that through taxation, but uh, mostly they just do it through more inflation. So basically, you just see purchasing power go down. Well, if we had a government that could just print fiat money, that could still happen. Uh, and if we were just to think about it theoretically, you know, just theoretically, politicians in the government have a very strong incentive to uh, pay for their actions, for their political programs, whether that whether we agree with them or not, whether they're paying for defense or vote buying and through social welfare, they have every incentive to do that by printing money rather than taxation because it's it's a harder to track. There there are cases in history where societies become aware of this uh, during hyperinflations and and people start to or even just really strong inflations not necessarily just hyperinflations where people will start to become aware and say okay they'll equate the government printing programs with their loss in value the, the destruction of their savings and the um, confiscation of their property because the government will come and um, usually they'll probably set in price controls and they'll just say okay well we're, we're taking the they'll, they'll take stuff they'll take uh, property uh, resources, and they'll exchange it for paper uh, at a price that they'll dictate, and the paper won't be worth anything near what they've actually exchanged for. So you've just basically been robbed. Uh, you know, the Confederacy when they invaded the North, like it, just prior to the Ga Battle of Gettysburg, the Army of Northern Virginia, they would just you know confiscate everything that they would take. But they say, well, we're paying for it. They would write, you know, they'd give Confederate money. To the people who they were taking it from, and that didn't make it not theft. Although actually today, that Confederate money is worth more than uh, Federal Reserve notes are, which is pretty amazing. If you think about that. Uh, so, just theoretically, there's no reason to assume that uh, a fiat currency controlled by the government would just not be inflationary. And, and uh, more than that. We have empirical evidence. We have history, and history totally supports this. Uh, the three most famous examples that I'm familiar with, although I'm sure they're not the only ones, is um, I think it's is a it Ming Dynasty China. It, it ended in the 1400s. China was the first country to have paper money, uh, and they had massive inflation, and it got so bad that the government stopped doing it, and they switched to a silver standard, and that's the standard they had all the way up until like the Communist Party took over up until the early 20th century. They're still on a silver standard. Um, another example, which is one that um, Bill still actually talks about, but he, he frames it quite erroneously, is the so-called colonial script. The colonies in the United States had uh, started printing money. Or actually, originally, he talks about it in the context of the revolution. It actually started much earlier than that. Uh, the Massachusetts Bay or the Plymouth, one of those two, colonies started issuing it um, basically as a way to pay debts. The story there is uh, every year or so the, that colony would actually attack Quebec. Uh, they'd, they'd muster the militia and they'd say, let's go attack French Canada, Quebec and Montreal. And uh, they would succeed and they'd come back with all this plunder, you know, with furs and, you know, whatever valuable goods were there, which actually there weren't that many because French Canada was 
piss poor up until just a few decades before the French and Indian War. But one year, I think in the 1690s, oh, I could have the, the, the decade wrong, they lost. They, they attacked and they were repulsed. And so they came back empty-handed. And all the militia people were like, well, that sucked, but we still have to get paid. And so the, uh, the government said they would do a one-time issue of paper currency. You know, and people were kind of leery about this and said it's only going to be one time. And, of course, uh, ended up not happening. And they ended up printing a whole lot, and there was, you know, hyper. There was strong inflation. These these notes lost value uh, pretty quick. The initial one was like, okay, this is the set value. We can work with this. And then as soon as they issued the next one, people started to anticipate a fall, and and, and so there was basically a rise in prices vis-a-vis -vis this material. Oh, I'm fairly certain. Uh, I'm gonna have to read Edward Vieira's book before I can know too much about this, but. Uh, I think that there are still other currencies circulating, but these paper ones dropped. Now, during the revolution, this got to be a huge problem, and and they were overtly confiscatory. They were arming the, they were supplying the army. You know, they'd go to farmers and say, "Okay, we're taking your cows, we're taking your sheep, we're taking your wagons, we're taking your horseshoes." And I mean, just and they didn't just take it; they'd buy it with this paper, and then this paper would not be worth. You know, they'd buy a wagon for a thousand colonial notes, whatever, and to buy another wagon, because of there's so much inflation, you would need a million or, you know, 10,000. So you, you've just been robbed of nine-tenths of a wagon or nine-tenths of a cow or whatever it was. And they actually made attempts to keep inflation down so that when people paid their taxes in it, the colonial governments would actually burn this money. They would have bonfires. Uh, so even back then, they were aware that it was a, a potential problem. Now, Bill Sill's documentary, The Money Masters, basically paints a very laudatory picture of uh, this period. And then he quotes Ben Franklin. And Ben Franklin's a really smart guy. And, you know, I mean, he's worth listening to. I remember reading his autobiography when I was a kid. But uh, he made money as a printer of this money. He was hired by at least one of the colonies and maybe even the Continental Congress. I'm not sure. Uh, since he was a printer, to make this stuff, and he would do things to make it harder to counterfeit, like putting a leaf, he put, he would put a, he would press a leaf, or a leave, I'm getting my nouns, plurals wrong, uh, in there, and it would be kind of, it would be really hard to duplicate, because he'd have that original leaf, and you can find an original leaf that looked exactly like that, and whatnot, but he's, he's not the best source on something like this, and it was such a bad idea that they did away with it, and that's, um, it's my understanding. I'm not an expert on this. Uh, that's why the Constitution defines uh, dollars in terms of gold and silver, a, weight, a, a certain number of grains, 300 and something grains of gold, and uh, yeah, something like that. I don't remember exactly. Uh, and and not the issue of currency. The other the other one is uh, that I'm familiar with is uh, Revolutionary War France. They issued currencies, uh, azignats, and then mandats. And um, they had to issue two because the first one they issued became worthless. And this is kind of similar to what a non-redemptive gold standard would be like because they didn't say it was based on nothing. They said it was based on the land, you know, all the lands held by the state of France. I think at one point they confiscated all the church lands too. And they said, well, so we've got, you know, all this land that has all this capital value, that's, that has all this property value, and we'll just issue notes on top of it and so the notes will have value because you'll be able to you know uh use the notes to buy land it, it was kind of weird because i don't think that there is exclusivity where you could say ah here's my 0.15 hectares and but they would end up doing is they would just say oh we need to spend more and so they just print more and more and more and I, they destroyed one and then they had to switch to another one and uh it was a huge disaster, and then they had to start passing laws, forcing people to use it, saying, okay, um, you know, you have to accept the Azignats or the Mandats, or else you'll get executed. It was a cap it became a capital crime. This was the same thing was true in China, at least according to Marco Polo. He said that it, was, it carried a death sentence to not use paper. Uh, it got even worse in Revolutionary War France. Of course, Revolutionary War France started passing capital punishment for just about everything, kind of like the Soviet Union did. Uh, and 
it even became a capital crime to ask people how they were going to pay because if someone was going to pay you in gold and silver, it would be one price. If they were going to pay you in in mazandats or ma, or mandats or azanyats, you would want to charge them a lot more. So uh, merchants and anyone who's going to buy and sell would often try and guess or ask, "What are you going to pay with me?" before they'd quote a price. And that became just to ask ahead of time became a capital offense. I don't know how many people were actually guillotined for it. Probably not many, but um, if there is a if there is an example of a fiat currency that didn't fail, of course there's another one. John Law had a scheme where he basically did this too in the the South Sea bubble. I'm not as familiar with that either, but I where where Bill still gets the idea that you know they can't do it. I think part of it is and this is something that you hear from the greenbackers a lot. Well, you always hear the Fed is private. The Fed is private. The, Fed, the, the problem with the Fed is that it's not really part of the government. And the implication here is that if stuff is in the government, somehow uh, we can control it and uh, restrain it in some way. And I, I don't think it's true to say that we have no effect on the government and that the government is 100% isolated from the influence of the populace and that it's completely able to do whatever it wants. But the controls against it by the populace are extremely, and I don't mean this like in the cliche, but they're, they're retarded. I mean, they're, the influence you have is blunted and distorted and many times... Um, in, inferior to any of the cliches that a democracy would suggest. Uh, if you're predicating the effectiveness of on your system uh, on people being able to restrain the government from printing, then, I mean, you're just not paying attention. You're living in, in a fantasy world because the people's ability to do that is demonstrably very weak. And it's part of its rational ignorance, uh, part of it is the idea of concentrated um, benefits but dissipated costs. So, yes, the inflation hurts everybody, but if you're the recipient of that inflation, maybe because you're on a pension or because you're on welfare or more likely because you're in the military-industrial complex or you're a worker in, a, say, a General Motors factory that's getting a bailout, then you have a much stronger incentive to be in favor of that than the people who are going to see a 0.0001% decrease in their overall purchasing power because of that inflation. Uh, there is no way to do this. I know like Milton Friedman, who was one of the people I have very mixed feelings about. He's really great on some things and he's just not so great on other things. This is one of those things where, you know, he wanted there to be a certain amount of inflation. But what's the right amount? I mean, 3% or is it, should it be 3.0025%? You know, <laughs> could he have some scientific basis for saying me wrong? saying I was wrong for saying that, or that it should be 2.933%. You know, there's no... <laughs> uh, and you can't have a fiat currency that doesn't print anything. I mean, it would be one thing to say, let's print it all and not print anymore. Although if you did that, historically, you'd end up with deflation. Like, uh, that's the case with Confederate dollars. Confederate dollars haven't been printed in a long time. People have made copies, but they don't aren't valued the same. And so uh, there's been deflation, and now they're worth... I mean, they, they they had hyperinflation in the Confederacy, and it wasn't worth anything at the end. And now they're actually worth something. They're not worth tons. They're not like gold. You know, they're worth more than the actual federal government's notes, which I find hilariously ironic and fitting. Um, nothing says fuck you to the federal government like pro-Confederacy stuff, whatever other faults we might find with them. Uh, I also heard this happen in Iraq after the Saddam Hussein fell. You know, he didn't print any more Iraqi dinars or whatever they called their fiat currency. And uh, the United States came in there and then we were printing our own fiat currency, not dollars, but whatever one was there. And they actually, the, de the, the old dinars that weren't being printed anymore uh, deflated. They became more valuable. They had greater purchasing power. I don't know how long that lasted or to what extent, but uh, that, that's a pretty interesting story right there. So um, I feel really indebted to like the money masters though, because before that I really did not care or study economics at all. Um, there's a real tendency, and I, th I wish I should have said this earlier, but this is what happens when you ad lib a video. Um, 
most academic subjects are so divorced from reality that it's hard to see how they're relevant, especially in our day-to-day -day lives. So we might say, well, chemistry is important if you're a chemist, but not to everybody. Chemistry is fundamentally important, but like most of us don't need to know about it, and so we can just gloss over it. And economics is one of those things where it's just, most people when they hear it, and this is the way I was, it's like, yeah, whatever, like, honestly, I don't care. And I was a pretty hardcore libertarian minarchist who, you know, thought the government was evil and killed people and all this stuff. And I didn't give a shit about economics. I didn't know anything about any economics, let alone Austrian economics. And I watched the Money Masters and it suddenly, like, whether the effect that inflation has on society suddenly became a very pertinent and relative and, and, and important question, something that I should know, like, that... The, literally affects me in a very important way and that I should know I should I should understand what the bearing of inflation or deflation or fiat currency has on me and prior to that I'm sure I'd come across economic related things I know I had heard of Friedrich Hayek I know I had heard of Milton Friedman I know I had heard the term deflation and inflation and taxes and um, Federal Reserve I know when I was in eighth grade I actually uh, read an article about the second bank of the United States and just remember thinking this is so stupid and boring I don't even get why why are they making us learn this and I was a history buff and it's like this is so irrelevant and Bill Stills money masters changed all that in me and it made me think this this is important and from then on every time I heard a name or anything I look into it and that it was only after that I mean I was practically an anarcho capitalist before I ever even looked into Austrian economics this is how bad it was I actually met Lou Rockwell and had lunch with him once <laughs> and I did not know what the Austrian school of economics was I didn't know who Ludwig von Mises was or Murray Rothbard I had heard of Hayek and had not heard of the other two and uh, this was just before I actually saw the money masters uh, he came and spoke. There was a local local guy in our area, uh, you know, paleo conservative, ultra, you know, libertarian in a lot of ways, but an evangelical Christian. And he would have a lecture series. He'd bring someone in twice a year, and they brought in Lou Rockwell one year. And I went and, and watched. And afterwards, we would always go out to the, an Applebee's across from the conference center. And a wealthy patron who uh, encouraged me to invest in silver, by the way, would always pay for everyone's meal, and. You know, I sat right, right across the table from Lou Rockwell. I'd never heard of the Mises Institute. You know, we had a nice discussion. You know, the round table wasn't just me and him. It was everybody there. But uh, I didn't know anything about Austrian economics. I feel like it was a huge waste of opportunity. And because up to that point, I really didn't care. And he, gave, he was handing out flyers. So he gave me a big flyer about the Mises Institute and all that stuff. And I just thought, this just sounds so... Ludwig, Ludwig von Mises, it sounds so esoteric you know like something that I should care nothing about and Bill Stills documentary um, changed that for me and it changed that for a lot of people and it's a really popular documentary and on net it's it's a good thing but it has bad economics in there and and the the stuff about you know the elites controlling everything that has bad economics if you really care about if you really think conspiracy theories are interesting but you want an analysis of the Fed that is much better economically and much more robust theoretically than I highly, I can't recommend enough the book The Creature from Jekyll Island by G. Edward Griffith. I'm sure you can listen to it on audiobook. I'm sure it's been audio recorded on YouTube. Uh, I got a copy for free that was given out by the Libertarian Think Tank, the Mackinac Center. I went to Michael Badnarik's speech and they were there handing out all kinds of free books. That was one of them. I didn't read it for several more years, but it is a masterpiece. I mean, literally a masterpiece, and I've heard Griffin, uh, Gerard Griffith, uh, say that it's his most popular book by far. That his publisher calls him every couple months and says, "Well, we sold out. We got to do another run," <laughs> which is good. good. Good for him. I'm glad that that's the case. It's an amazing book, uh, and it's far the superior to Bill Still. Um, although, again, I'm grateful for Bill Still. I'm grateful for the Money Masters. It's a lot of history. Uh, you know, he gets it wrong in a couple spots. I can't, I can't in good conscience advocate greenbackerism or, you know, or, or this kind of, uh, summary hatred of private things. You know, like if, if, if only if it was run by the government, that's just such a stupid 
thing for people to think, especially people who are somewhat libertarian. I think Bill still, I don't think Bill still is a socialist and he wants the government to run everything. I mean, but this is, think about it like this. Let's say, let's say we told Bill still that, you know, hey, we found out that the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers have huge, they don't have a huge gold store, which is what he thinks. Maybe they do, but let's, let's say we found out they had a huge store of bullets and guns. They just had just giant arsenals of guns and bullets. Would you then say, well, man, we should not allow other people to have guns and bullets because then the Rothschilds could manipulate the price of guns and bullets and they'd have all that much more power? No. No, the more people who had guns and bullets, the more equity there would be. The more, the more um, parity of power, the less abuse there's going to be. I remember Thor's Miter saw had a great saying. It was, the parity of power promotes peaceful solutions. The more... Uh, likely, the the more similar two antagonists are in their physical capabilities, the less likely they are to fight. If you're vastly stronger than somebody else, then you're much more inclined to get in a conflict with them than if you're equally powerful to them. Because then you have all the incentives are that you have less risk, you know, possibly more reward. If if the Rothschilds have a whole bunch of guns, it wouldn't make sense to say no one else should have guns because then they can manipulate the price. And likewise, if the, if it's actually true, and I don't know, maybe it is, that they secretly control all the gold, then all we need to do is abolish state protectionism and their wealth, if, it's, if they're really ill-gotten gains, which is what they primarily are, at least that's the conspiracy theory, then they will erode away. And... The more other people who have gold, the more of us who have stacks of our own, even if individually they don't compare. Every every and this is this is something. I mean, not long after I saw um, the Money Masters, probably within six months to a year, that I kind of resolved to start buying gold and silver, and I probably started buying silver. There's no way I could afford gold back then. I was in college, but you know, every single silver round you buy, every single ounce, and even every single dime. That's a measure of control and and um, safety for yourself, and power for yourself, and influence, and, and independence. Now, one ounce isn't going to make the difference in your entire lifetime, but it makes a difference within a week, or within a day, or within one grocery bill. And the more that you can have, the better. And the encouraging other people to do the same, since it helps them, it helps you. You know, and I I just don't. Uh, fortunately, I think these green these greenbackers are kind of losing because uh, Ron Paul is s firmly, firmly, well within, integrally part of the Austro-Libertarian gold standard and indeed market money um, group, and his influence is monumental. Uh, it is beyond the influence of all others at this point, and he is he does not steer people to the money masters into the books that are against the Fed from the. Greenbacker point of view, but to the the Austro libertarian point of view, and uh, you know, in that in that sense, what Bill still is, and the Greenbackers, they're kind of like objectivists. They're you know different. They're similar in some ways, but it's not the same animal. So anyway, that's it. Uh, my battery's about to die, so I'm going to call it quits. But all right, cheers.